for a new society. And I have to give credit here to brother, raise his name, brother Macandal. In 1758, way back then, he had this broad organization intending to kick out all the colonists from the land and to free the land and take over the land. And so he started a campaign of getting people to killing the plantation owners over the entire colony. And Brother Macandal was, he was feared, his movement was pretty powerful until he was betrayed and captured and they burned him at the stake. But Brother Macandal said, when he was being burned, he said, they can't kill me. I will turn into a mosquito and I will live on forever and I will continue to harass them. Now, what that meant was, and while they were burning him, and I'm going to that to explain to you why this tradition remained in our people. Now, keep that in mind, 1758. That was a widespread movement with the aim being, I will say, independence, freeing the land and taking it over for the African people to take it over, for the enslaved Africans to take it over. So, as he was being burned, Macandal somehow freed himself from the, he got loose, and he jumped out of the fire. <laughs> so everybody said, Macandal sauvé, <laughs> meaning Macandal has escaped. So what he had predicted remained in the minds of people. And even though many people knew, you know, enough that he had been killed, the planters made sure they, but still the, the slogan, Macandal sauvé, or Macandal couldn't be killed, he symbolized that desire for freedom and there were continuous, continuous organizations. So when people gathered in 1791 and Brother Bookman and Cecil Fatima had that prayer calling on the gods of Africa, on the Loires, the spirits of the, their ancestors to give them the courage and to all stick together until they free the land, liberty or death, no compromise, freeing the land. That was a vision of the, the founding of a nation. And that's what, and the reason I bring it up, it's that spirit that animated the 13 years of consistent struggle that took place during that time. It took 13 years because our foremothers and forefathers, and again, I want to raise the women and their leadership because even the French general like Pamphile de la Croix, who faced them in battle, he wrote in his memoirs, in battle the women were more ferocious than the men. And yesterday I mentioned this sister named Sanit Belair. She was a lieutenant, a lieutenant in the French army commanded by Napoleon. She was only 21 years old. And at a certain point, when the French in 1802, after they had kidnapped and arrested Toussaint Louverture, this woman and her husband, who was a general, now she was only 21 years old, and she won her rank in battlefields. She took to the hills with her husband to fight against the French, starting a guerrilla, joining the Maroons, the guerrilla movement, and the French um, captured her and, uh, and they executed her. She died at the age of 21, a full lieutenant. So now this is something that just caught my eye the other day because I always knew her name, Sanit Belair, but I didn't know. She was a full-fledged lieutenant in the army who won her rank through combat at such a young age and both she and her husband were executed. The reason... Can you her name again? Sanit. Sanit. S-A-N-I-T-E. Belair. Belair, you might spell it like in English, Belair. B-E-L, but all one word, all small letters. There were other women commanders too, like Mary Jeanne, Mary Jane, another one who distinguished herself in the fort of Creta Pierrot, defeating, landing the French, a lot of defeats. The reason I bring this up is to tell you that throughout our history, the women have led, 
have had positions of leadership and power in the struggle for freedom. It was a people's war. Now, the good thing about the history of Haiti today, a lot is being uncovered. Now, I know Gerald mentioned that Toussaint had been a slave owner. I, I'll have to double check on that because I knew he had been a manager at the plantation. Uh, kind of, a, he wasn't a field slave, but he was very talented and he had a po certain position. So I'll have to verify, I'll have to, because there is a lot of new research, new documents coming forward. So I'll have to check that out for myself. And, uh, but I thank Gerald for raising that issue because that's pointing me to where I should go looking for stuff. Um, why I raise this, the history, it's because today, this is what our young people are finding out more about this history of our people. Haiti became, uh, declared its independence in 1804 after the defeat of the French in 1803. After that, Haiti was consumed, the Haitians were consumed with the idea of abolishing slavery. Their foreign policy of Haiti was the abolition of slavery and also to, uh, to build a society that would be based on a egalitarian basis and being completely and totally against colonialism. Now that had to do with self-preservation. And also back in those days, these were colonies where Africans had, who had been kidnapped had been enslaved. Now today, we, I might see myself as a Haitian. I see another black person as a Jamaican or Trinidadian or, you know, born in the US, African-American. But back then, there was no such thing because we were not citizens at all. Only the French Revolution declared, and it was a struggle, that the enslaved Africans were now free they made them French citizens, but no place else was anybody regarded as a citizen, including in the US. So what motivated these Africans who fought and succeeded in getting their freedom was the memory of being free people in America, the kidnapping of our foremothers and forefathers has been such a brutal breaking up of families because mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, cousins, community members were separated from each other. So there was this longing for family. And so people wanted to reconnect, rebuild the family, and they were angry that somebody could have done that to their families. And so they wanted to reconnect. So part of the motivation was to see to it that slavery, this odious system, would be ended. And that was another thing that motivated Haiti to declare itself. By the way, with about two-thirds of the Africans at that time who fought in the struggle for independence, being born in Africa, from different parts of Africa, they could have named the land Dahomey. They could have named it Congo. They were from so many different parts. Somebody told me there were 21 different uh, people from different um, who referred to themselves as Igbos or Congos or Mandingos, but there were also, uh, somebody else mentioned that there were over a hundred, but they formed the language among themselves, Creole, which is still spoken today, which is the, the official language of Haiti, along with French. And they could communicate, but they took the name Haiti after independence and what we call a pan-African, an early expression, an early demonstration of a pan-African revolution. <coughs> and these Africans took over the plantations and they nationalized them. They made them state property. Now, I heard that from one young man in Haiti. He hadn't thought of it that way before. He said if it were in today's language, they, it would be called nationalizing. They took over the means of production and nationalized them. Now, the whole question internally was the masses of our people wanted the land to be distributed among themselves. 
but you had others who were who grew up in who studied in France and who were infused with the ideology of maintaining the colonial system. So some of the former freedmen had plantations. Some of them had people who were enslaved. They were part of the new society. They were fighting against the French because the French wanted everybody to lose their privilege, Napoleon, by restoring slavery. He wanted everybody to, um, to lose their privilege. So they all jumped in the struggle together with the Africans. However, their views on the development of the country, on how to develop the economy, were very different from the masses of our people. And this is the struggle that's taking place today in Haiti. It has been taking place. I will illustrate that with Brother Goma. Goma was one such, he had been a slave, he's from the South. And I'm so proud of him that my son, I, his middle name is Goma, Shanga Goma La Bossière. And Goma had been fighting as a Maroon. During the struggle for independence, he was part of the regular revolutionary army. After independence, he kept on advocating for land distribution. When Dessalines was assassinated in the first coup of 1806, because he was pushing for land distribution as one of the reasons of his assassination, Goma said, we want land. What they did was they reneged on that because the coup had been to maintain the old economy like the, plan, the colonial period. And so Goma organized a, slave, a, a, a peasant army and continued the guerrilla warfare against the, the government of Alexandre Pétion and Jean-Pierre Boyer and pushed and successfully was, he was successful in getting some land distributed to the people. So throughout the 19th century, internally, there had been this struggle for, to reshape the economy so that it would be an economy that, would, that our people, the masses of our people, the formerly enslaved, could benefit from this vision of an egalitarian society. On the, out, on, on the foreign policy front, Haiti declared itself a sanctuary nation and appealed to enslaved people who, who, if they broke free, they could come to Haiti and they would, be, they would receive sanctuary and Haiti would rec recognize them as Haitian citizens and nobody could touch them. And Haiti also appealed to revolutionaries who were fighting against colonialism. And here I will mention the name of Miranda, who came to Haiti, Francisco Miranda, who came to Haiti in 1805 met with Dessalines, and Dessalines promised him support in his struggle against the Spanish. Uh, later on, 1810, somewhere there, became uh, Simon Bolivar came, and he received, he came to my hometown, landed there, defeated by the Spanish. They needed help. The population came out and really supported them. The Haitian president, Pétion, gave them money, weapons, ships, and volunteers, people who had been in the struggle, who had successfully fought against the Spanish and the British and the French, people who experienced, and sent, them, sent him back with those ships and those volunteers. Many Haitians shed their blood in South America to end colonialism and uh, also to abolish slavery. Because when Bolivar asked, how can I repay you? Pétion said, you have to abolish slavery everywhere where you will be, where you will liberate territories. So Haiti was consumed with that. 1822, the Dominican Republic had not yet been created. It was a Spanish colony where slavery was being practiced and where they had threatened that they could take Haitians, kidnap them, and sell them as slaves. So it was a Spanish colony. People there rebelled and appealed to Haiti for support, and the Haitian military went there uh, freed, defeated the Spanish, and declared the abolition of slavery. What year? That we are talking 1822. So there was a march for the abolition of slavery continuously taking place, with Haiti being very active in that. In addition to that, in terms of solidarity, solidarity is in the DNA of the Haitian people. 
And it's not because we're unique people or anything, but it's because of the histories of our struggle. One of the things that I will add about the Haitian Revolution, the ideas of the revolution, the ideas of um, the revolutionary ferment that was taking place in Europe, Napoleon had sent troops from Poland, some Polish troops, and also from Germany to restore slavery. But when they got there and they saw what was really going on, they defected from Napoleon's command and joined the Africans, turning their guns against the French. Mm. And many of these Polish troops, Polish descendants, live in Haiti today in many parts of Haiti. Wow. Actually, in 1969, one of the towns inhabited by the descendants of the Polish, named Kazal, the mm. people there rebelled. There was a guerrilla movement. See, many people do not know that in the 60s there were many guerrilla movements taking place in Haiti, both from the right and the left, but this was as part of a left guerrilla struggle. Spell the name of the person you mentioned. Kazal. Kazal is a town where many of the Polish descendants are. They were part of this movement, and Papa Doc Duvalier unleashed the Tonton Marcouts on them. Somebody betrayed, again, just like in the days of slavery, somebody betrayed, and they were systematically, there was a huge massacre in Kazal, but Kazal still remains as a legend, legendary place in the hearts and minds of people of Haiti because of their heroic resistance against Papa Doc Duvalier. So these are people who trace their history way back to, the, to their fight in the, uh, in the movement for Haitian independence. Um, 1820s, Haiti supported the struggle for Greek independence. When the, Greece, when the Greek were fighting for their independence, they appealed to Haiti for support. See, a lot of this is not in the history books. And I'm not sharing that with you as a way to beat our chest and all of that. But I'm saying somebody has been lying for a reason. Mm -hmm. They don't want us to know the history of the solidarity and collaboration of people with people across borders and across racial lines. They, it's to their advantage to pit us black against white and white Very against well. black and different groups against different, that way we always, you always divided. But people back then knew and they struggled together. And this is the history that we need to put out there to explain to people. It's been done before, just like the San Patricio Brigade fought in the Mexican along with the brothers and sisters from Mexico. That was the same thing that had taken place there, and we need to uphold that part of the history. So, and Haiti at the time, in regards to the Greeks, Haiti needed its weapons in order to defend itself against a European a colonialist uh, invasion and, and restoration of slavery. So Haiti said, look, we need our weapons, but we'll give you coffee because Haiti was a big producer of coffee, and coffee back in those days was like gold. So Haiti sent them shiploads of coffee, say, sell that, buy yourself some guns, and, 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 which, and they were successful. And the Greek government sent a representative of the government to Haiti in the 1820s to thank Haiti for their for its support. So, I just want to raise this last issue and then we can open it. What does that have to do with the present? As many of you know, the press usually, including the progressive media, Haiti, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. And I take an issue with that on many, for many reasons. One, when they say that they oversimplify the story, Haiti is not a poor land. Haiti is a land where there are many, many mineral resources. And that's what they are after. Haiti has gold, Haiti has oil, Haiti has iridium, uranium, Haiti has copper, silver, and all of that, which have been exploited by people without the Haitian people benefiting from any of it. But also, one of the things they point to, one of the things I like to mention, is that Haiti has been impoverished. When you say it's the poorest country, then it's nobody's fault. It just happens to be you're poor, you know? 
it just happens to be an accident of God. God didn't bless you, so you're poor. No. Haiti, as Marilyn Longlaw, a friend, uh, member of the Haiti Action Committee, has said, ha the Haitian people are one of the most robbed people in the Western Hemisphere. Now, when you put it that way, then you start asking the question, who robbed them? One of the things that, one of the early examples of the robbery that occurred is not only the exploitation of her foremothers and forefathers working from Kent in the morning until Kent Sea at night mm -hmm. during slavery, but also after that, all the colonialist powers, the US, France, Canada, um, Canada not, Ca really. not Canada, uh, Spain, Britain, they collaborated and forced Haiti to pay reparations to the former slave owners. To, to France. To France. To France, to the French who used to own plantations there. Do you remember how much that was? Yes. The amount they charged was 150 million gold francs, which in today's money, according yes. to a French economist uh, who just recently wrote an article, President Aristide demanded that the French restore that money to us back in 2003. And at that time, they had calculated it to to the value of $21.7 billion. Now, if we are looking at in today's money, it will be $28 billion, according to this French economist who last week published an article about it. What it was was like we were forced to pay that. And when you are talking about the debt that many of the countries who became independent owe Oh, in quotation marks, right? The, they are former colonizers. Then you see Haiti is an early example of that uh, rip off, the continuous ripping off of people going way back after they become independent. Instead of them paying us what they stole, right. we had to pay them right. for, for that money. Don't forget that interest bearing debt. That's yeah. right, that's right, that's right. So, so, um, so one of the things that um, President Aristide did, and that's how we connect with our past. So usually in the newspapers, when they present the struggle in Haiti, they don't connect any of this. But the people of Haiti connect it all. You speak to any young person or any older person, they'll tell you right, right off the bat. And they will connect the resistance today with what happened back then and the continue, in other words, they are in the streets to complete the Haitian Revolution, the promises of our foremothers and forefathers to us to have an, a society that's, um, that's based on equality of, uh, so that our people could live a life of dignity as human beings. So um, this money, Haiti was forced to pay. Haiti had to pay it starting in 1826 and Haiti didn't finish paying it until 1947. Until 1947. Monies that should have gone to build the nation <coughs> were going into the pockets of people who had robbed us of our freedom, had robbed us of our labor, had robbed us and accumulated capital, as Gerald Men um, pointed out so beautifully, on our back. And then they turn around and say that um, we, we have we this, we have that. that. Now, we had a popular government. The people of Haiti fought against um, the, when the U.S. Took, came to Haiti and took over in 1915. It was to, as a result of this powerful movement of the grassroots. I'd mentioned the peasant armies before. So in the South, in the 1840s, you, you had a peasant army called the Pickets. And then in the North, the peasant army was called the Kakos and they were fighting for land distribution. They were fighting the internal struggle, but the internal struggle was never an internal struggle only. It was linked to colonialists, to the colonialists and to these imperialists who wanted to control our economy and control the labor of our people. And so the struggle went on. And so as our people in 1915 came close to taking power, just like they did in Mexico, the US came in and invaded um, kept Haiti, occupied Haiti for 19 years, and in the process killed at least 20,000 Haitians, right. many of the members of that peasant army, the Kakos. 
destroyed our economy, forcing the mass, the first mass migration of Haitians leaving Haiti during that period of the occupation. That's what was going on. And by the way, you hear many times some environmentalists talk about, well, the people of Haiti have deforested Haiti. And I say to them, no, you cannot say that. You got to be politically aware and look at the situation. Haiti, as part of its payment to France, was forced to cut down all those forests. The payment had to be made in the form of timber or anything else that Haiti was producing. This is what was going on. The peasant population was fighting against that and rebelling against governments that were collaborating with the whole thing. Yes, and my brother is showing me here a picture of Charlemagne Perrault. 1915, he was the leader of the Carcos, of the peasant rebellion. And as frequently happens, Charlemagne Perrault, whenever you see the name Perrault around here, that's it. It's just the ending is with me. Thank you very much. And Charlemagne Perrault was betrayed and, and, and killed. And um, bringing it to today with Duvalier, Duvalier happens to be one in a series of those dictators. And uh, Duvalier had been, Papa Doc Duvalier, he had been part of the movement. And here we have to be careful in the movement. We got to open our eyes. Many times the movement is betrayed by people from within. And as we say in Creole, say, rat kai kap manje pai kai. That means it's the rat of the house that is destroying the house from the inside. So Papa Doc Duvalier was recruited early on. He had been part of the movement in the 30s against the U.S. occupation. And in the 40s, he was even a member of MOP, the movement of workers and peasants. But the U.S. recruited him and he started working for them as an agent. So by the time they made him a dictator in 1957 and helped him create the death squads called the Tonton Makuts, Papa Doc knew enough about all the brothers and sisters who had been in the struggle. He knew them because he had been a part of it. And he systematically went after the brothers and sisters who were part of the movement of the 30s and the 40s. And um, there was a famous movement called the Revolution of 1946 of workers, students, and peasants. Papa Doc knew all of that. And he really went after many of these militants, including to the present day. And this is what we are still. We are, uh, that's how the movement is. It, today, it's linked to all of that, and the new, the young people are fighting to change this situation, being fully aware of that history. So I will stop right here, and um, uh, thank you so much for your solidarity. Later on, I'll mention some about our solidarity and what's going on today. Thank you. I think we are all very much enlightened by the talk today. And we'll have a chance to talk more about it in a minute. Plus, applause is cheap, uh, and we need to make our we need money, basically. Uh, so I'm going to pass around the Nebel Proctor Marxist Library app. Please fill it with money. And uh, I want to say that uh, we're a grassroots organization. We get 